morning. Um, I'd like to thank you all for having me here today. Um, so the conference is radiology for the non-neuroradiologist, or the non-radiologist, and I am a non-radiologist. So that's the good news here. Um, we see lots of strokes as uh, neurology residents in our second year. So I've had a lot of time and experience learning to read the imaging myself. Um, you know, we, you know, have seen a lot of the nurse practitioners on our night calls, and sometimes that's when the strokes pick up. Um, so I'm going to go over the basics of reading CT scans and MRIs with you all, showing you kind of the pathology that you might see in cases where patients have um, had strokes and kind of what you should look for and how to manage that. All right, so as far as disclosures, I have none. <laughs> All right, an acute stroke. So stroke, as we know, is a really devastating condition, high morbidity and high mortality. Um, it's the le leading cause of long-term disability in the United States, and also, which it used to be the third leading cause of death, we're doing better at picking up on these cases and getting people in earlier. So it's now the fifth leading cause of death, but it's still uh, a major uh, problem, um, especially in our communities. Um, and each year, 795,000 people in our country has a stroke, and strokes are responsible for the deaths of 130,000 Americans each year. And every four minutes, according to the CDC, one American dies from a stroke. So that would be 15 people in the next hour. Um, and, you know, I know that besides patients, you know, almost most of us in this room have probably had a family member, friend, loved one who's been affected by stroke. Okay, and so as far as our part um, in caring for stroke patients, um, you know, whether it's in the ED or if it's on one of the floors, you know, when somebody comes in with stroke-like symptoms, everybody's on high alert major emergency. Anytime you have a patient who's got a facial droop or they were moving their arm an hour ago and now they're not, you know, the stroke team is alerted immediately and everybody comes into action. Um, and you, the time is the most important thing. It's critical. The sooner that you get to these patients, the sooner that you get the imaging done, the more likely you're able to get intervention in place as early as possible. So what I'm going to do first is go over some cases with you all. Um, these are patients that I actually saw on my calls. Um, and then afterwards, we're going to go into the actual neuroimaging a little more in depth to kind of show you what to look for um, and some of the findings that you can get. Okay. And at the end of the pr presentation, um, I hope you all be able to identify these um, you know, conditions with imaging. You'll understand some of the management that we use in the stroke cases that we see and gain some confidence when you are able to pull up the imaging yourself and kind of look at things and know what to do and how to manage these cases. Okay, so case one. We had a 49-year-old woman who had a history of myasthenia gravis. She received plasmapheresis one to two times a week. She also had some of the key risk factors for stroke, hypertension and diabetes, as well as obstructive sleep apnea. And she presented with a, uh, what we found to be a right MCA stroke, but she had multiple symptoms that were consistent with that. Um, not able to move her left side. Um, she was neglecting the left side and uh, you know, just multiple other things, sensory changes. And so when they did the imaging, they found uh, right MCA, um, M1, middle cerebral artery vessel occlusion, and ischemia. So this is her imaging on CT scan. And so the thing about reading uh, CT scans is first, and this is with um, you know, this imaging, you're looking at the patient as if you're staring from feet to head. Um, and so with the CT, this is like a high-powered imaging uh, technique that uses multiple x-rays, high radiation. And so on CT scan, you can see here, sorry, go back, where bone is bright because it's got a higher density than the other tissues. And then the brain matter, which is gray, we call that isodense. And then air is going to be dark. 
And so with this particular patient, um, I know I've already shown you because I clicked ahead, sorry about that, but um, the abnormality that we're looking at um, would be here. And so that is her right middle cerebral artery. And they found a hyperdensity there, which is the clot, because it's a higher density than normal blood would be just flowing through the vessels. And so that explains all of her symptoms and the fact that the patient was found to have a major stroke. And so this is another form of imaging called CT angiography. And so what it does is uh, it applies contrast. The patient's given contrast into the vein, and we're able to pick up the blood vessels a lot better with this one. And so you'll see here that at the same area that we looked at before with the CT scan, the patient has the clot which shows cut off with uh, the clot there uh, identifying the stroke. Okay, and this is an MRI, and we're going to talk about this a little more in detail. So these are the imaging uh, modalities that we look at uh, when we're looking at MRI. These are the sequences. Um, so the patient, uh, because of the clot, ended up having ischemia that's showing up here on both VWI uh, sequence as well as ADC. And um, this is the one that's able to tell us more with more sensitivity that the patient's got ischemia to uh, the brain because of a stroke. Okay, and that patient was picked up the next day by our day team um, and cared for after that. Uh, she wasn't within any window to get intervention at that point. Okay, and so the next case, we have a 37-year-old woman with a history of end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis. She also had poorly controlled diabetes, and she had already unfortunately had three strokes within that year, and hypertension, um, and just multiple other medical conditions. And so this was one of the nights when I was called over to the outpatient center. I had never had to go there for a stroke before, but. Um, you know, this was one of those cases when we get called, we go wherever it is in the hospital. Um, and so this patient was previously documented as having movement in all four extremities. But when we talked to the family, they said that she had actually been acting strangely, not talking to them for a couple of days prior. Um, and that's also important in how we time things. Um, it could point to the fact that the stroke might have been happening earlier than just right when she had the surgery or right before. And so I'm not going to go part by part with all of this, and we'll talk about the NIH stroke scale a little bit later, but this was probably one of the highest NIH stroke scales I've seen um, in any of the patients that I've cared for with strokes. Hers was 30, and the NIH stroke scale is basically something that we use in evaluation of the patient um, when we're examining them to determine the severity of their stroke. And so this lady, uh, unfortunately, had almost everything positive. Um, so level of consciousness was decreased. She wasn't able to follow commands, answer any of my questions. Um, her gaze was off. Um, she also was unable to move um, either side of the body very well, but this also could have been clouded by the fact that she wasn't able to communicate properly or understand what I was saying. Um, but this is her CTA. Um, I skipped to this one uh, because in this case she did have a stroke, but the problem with this uh, particular case was she had already had multiple strokes, and this is because of very bad uh, cerebrovascular disease. She had a lot of areas of stenosis, and this is here, um, here this is um, looking at the left middle cerebral artery. Um, it was the area that she was most affected by and showed up as the stroke, as we'll see in a few seconds. Um, but her vessels for her age, and she's only a couple of years older than me, her vessels are very small. They look, um, you know, very, you know, um, broken up. When you see a CTA, you should see the flow just go through to all those vessels, and it looks very clean. Um, and unfortunately, in this patient, we don't see that. Oh, yes. 
Um, actually, it's the darker part right here. Yeah. And so this is what happens when you get the contrast. You're supposed to see brightness throughout the vessels, and it should go along all of the vessels very cleanly to show that there's you know, adequate blood flow. So any of the breaks, like on the right side, mm -hmm. you see the dots on the left side. Yes. Uh-huh. Those are where the dark areas used to know. Yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. And so, and you can even see here, it's worse on the right than it is in the left side. And so that's because of this area here, which she didn't have an actual clot there, but she had so much calcification and atherosclerosis. There's nothing that's gonna be able to go through properly. And this is just a 3D reconstruction uh, that we also look at in the CTAs. Um, it's just another way to kind of look at it, and you can um, use the computer to turn it in all different directions so you get better visualization of where there's actual uh, loss of flow, if there is any, in the patients that you see with strokes. And so here it correlates with exactly what we just saw. There's no adequate flow there. I mean, she did have some, but it's not enough to properly perfuse that area of the brain. Like, you know, you or I would probably be expected to have normal blood flow. So that's just another thing that we use um, to kind of help us guide, guide us with therapy and to kind of understand what's going on with the patient. And this is her MRI, as we looked at earlier. Um, this is DWI, and I'll explain a little more to you about this. Um, but you see here, she's got changes. And anytime on DWI, when you see bright, um, which we also have to correlate that with ADC, but that means there's diffusion restriction, um, which you know shows up as ischemia. The patient's basically had a stroke, and hers has affected uh, multiple areas of her brain there, on um, the left side in the MCA territory. And it does correlate with ADC here. So ADC is the one where you should see dark, um, and those images have to be utilized together to truly diagnose that somebody has had ischemia or a stroke to the brain. So she's got some areas of darkness there that correlate with the DWI. And so ultimately, um, there was no ability to do intervention uh, in this patient either um, with either thrombectomy because she didn't have a large vessel occlusion or clot there. And also, we couldn't give TPA. She had just had surgery, and we couldn't pinpoint an adequate time last known well. Um, so they recommended an outpatient for vessel angiogram, um, and I'll touch on that a little later too, but angiogram is uh, the most uh, sensitive gold standard test to look at the blood vessels in the um, brain. Um, and with this patient, she was placed on heparin bridge to Coumadin. Um, she was also found to have antiphospholipid syndrome. Um, so they couldn't place her on both. So uh, what they did was uh, just send her out on Coumadin. Okay, and this is uh, the last case we're gonna talk about. Um, this was uh, one of my most, I think, rewarding cases because of the outcome. Um, but this was an 80-year-old man. He had a history of aortic stenosis, bradyarrhythmia, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. And he had just had a knee replacement in surgery like the day before. And he was in his room talking to his wife, and all of a sudden he was not talking normally. His wife said he was talking gibberish. It just was not his norm. And then from then on, he couldn't move one side of his body. He was having a stroke. So they sent him down immediately and paged us. Um, so we took him to the CT scan, and that's where I met him. And this is what I found on my exam. He had an NIH stroke scale of 25. Um, so he was not talking properly, he was not moving the entire right side of his body, he wasn't able to answer me, he wasn't able to follow any commands. As far as sensory, um, you know, we'll test sensory if we can't get any verbal response by squeezing the fingers, pinching, he could not respond to any of that. Um, so because of the surgery, we could not give TPA, he was within the window because they got him down there within 30 minutes of the symptom onset. Um, but when we looked at the CTA, we, or the CT scan, sorry, we saw a hyperdense um, vessel, you know, which we talked about a minute ago, 
Um, when you see anything that looks bright here on a CT scan, that means it's hyperdense, um, increased density. Blood is not supposed to look like this. And so we knew he had had a uh, stroke with a blood clot that went, either was already there or was sent straight to the MCA, uh, left MCA vessel. And so uh, after that, he was sent to the angiography suite. The neurointerventionalist was already here. He was able to get everything prepared, and he pulled out the clot within enough time, and the patient did very well afterwards. Um, I went to check on him about maybe seven hours after uh, the procedure was done, and he was talking, he was moving his right side, he could feel everything, and you know, he said, yeah, I don't remember some of the stuff that happened, but I remember you were there, and you know, yeah, that was pretty scary, huh? So I'm like, yes, it was, you know, especially for his wife, she was so worried, and you know, which I don't blame her, but this is one of the success stories because, you know, when we're able to get patients in in enough time and get the intervention done, I mean, it, and it's successful, I mean, it's just amazing. And the other thing, you know, as a second year resident, I was amazed at the size of the clots. Like if you ever get a chance to go in, if you all have patients who get sent for a thrombectomy, um, if you can stick around for a little while if there's time, it's always good to kind of see what the neurointerventionalist does um, and how they're able to remove the clot because that thing was so tiny and to say that something that small can cause you know, such a catastrophic change in a patient and those kind of symptoms. I mean, it was amazing. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's nice when we can have a story end up like this. Okay, and this is even more amazing. So, you know, an NIH stroke scale that high, you would expect a lot of damage, but because they were able to get in as fast as they did, look at that. That's not much of a change at all. I mean, it's still a stroke, but if he had not gotten um, down as quickly as he did um, and wasn't able to get that intervention, I can only imagine how much worse this image would have looked. Okay, so this is basically the mantra we kind of live by when we're dealing with stroke cases. Time is brain. Every minute counts, and the moment that you see something abnormal, anything that looks like it could potentially be a stroke, you know, we have to get on that immediately. And so the most important thing is knowing the time last known well. Um, and that can be tricky if it's somebody coming from outside because sometimes people wake up with stroke symptoms. So we kind of have to go by when they went to sleep the night before because that changes your treatment. Um, and then sometimes you're depending on EMS when they found the patient and there's no family around and family could probably tell you something different. Um, so that's some of the challenge of evaluation of a patient who's had stroke. Um, but, you know, pinpointing that time last known well is essential. Um, and then history, you know, when we go in and see stroke patients, there are specific questions that we need to know because that can determine whether we're going to be able to give TPA or not, whether the patient's going to be able to be sent down for thrombectomy or not. Um, we need to know if they're on anticoagulation because that could preclude somebody from being able to get TPA if they've been on Coumadin and they just took it this morning or, you know, they're on Xarelto or one of the other anticoagulants. Um, we also need to know about aneurysms um, because that could kind of change things. Um, you know, if the aneurysm's been clipped, it's been cared for, there's no bleed, you know, you can potentially treat that, but if you've had a bleeding aneurysm history, one that's currently, um, you know, active, that's gonna change some things as well. Um, any history of hemorrhage, if they've had recent GI bleed, recent stroke within the past three months, any major surgeries and history of atrial fibrillation. Um, strokes aren't just caused by uh, NC2 cerebrovascular disease. The heart uh, is definitely important when we're evaluating patients and looking at things because that could be a source of a clot, especially in patients with AFib. Cardioembolic stroke is something we see a lot here. Um, and so we need to know that history. We also need to know about endocarditis, if the valve has uh, vegetations, because that could be throwing um, 
you know, cardio emboli that can end up actually causing bleeds, and we've seen that happen before. Um, it's a clot, but the clot causes what's called mycotic aneurysms, um, and then we end up with another issue where we can't treat the way we normally would. Okay, and we also have our exam, which relies mainly on the NIH stroke scale, when it's somebody within the window, that's the thing that we do first. Even while I'm talking to patients, I'll still be examining them. Um, and then we look at different labs, like PTI and R, if the patient's on Coumadin um, or anticoagulation, we need to know what that is before we treat. Um, CMP, uh, which here at Methodist, we've started to just go ahead and do the CTAs if the patients are in the window, so creatinine doesn't have to be weighted on at this point. It's the brain or the kidneys, and if your brain is not, um, you know, able to function properly because you've had a major stroke and there's no intervention, um, then that's going to be more devastating than the kidneys being damaged by um, the contrast because we can always do dialysis if it gets bad enough, and they don't have to stay on dialysis. We just need to make sure we get that brain taken care of right away. Um, and then CBC to look at platelet counts. There are patients who come in with low platelets and you know, we need to know that before we give them a medication that can end up causing excessive bleeding. Um, and then our imaging, uh, CTA, uh, CT brain and CTA head and neck are the things that we do up front when the patient's within the window. Okay, and then here is our NIH stroke scale um, and it shows you the different areas that we examine like level of consciousness here. Um, we also try to ask them to follow commands. Um, we look at the face. That's one of the things I think you all have seen, um, the posters where they, they say fast. You look at the face. You check the arms. Um, you know, you get them uh, there to the hospital in time. Um, so those are the things that we can pick up pretty easily um, when we're examining them. And I was so proud of myself because I started out at the beginning of the year carrying these around for like three or four months. And then by the time I was finished with second year, I'm like, all right, I can do it off the top of my head. Yay for me. <laughs> and just pull out the book and let them look at the picture. So yeah, the confidence level increased over the course of the last year because we were so busy on call. Um, and so this is what we used to test for aphasia. Um, the patients will kind of look and tell you what's wrong with this picture, and you ask them to name some of these things, um, and sometimes they don't do very well. You'll hear people kind of mumbling things. Maybe they know what that is, but they can't really tell you that well, and sometimes they can't tell you at all. Um, and then we kind of ask them to read these sentences and repeat some of these words. So um, this is just kind of a part of, you know, if you all have been with us when we've been on call with, oh, yes, uh-huh. You have a question? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and that's happened a lot to us. Um, so we would count that morning um, symptom as the last known well, and even if it's worsened over time, I mean, if that was there this morning when he woke up, we'd kind of count that. Because the problem is that if you treat them and it looks like maybe they're within the window, like it's like two and a half hours, okay, we give the TPA. But then when you, you know, find out it's been like eight or nine hours. The stroke can actually be worsened if you treat it with TPA. Um, or even with thrombectomy, if it's outside of that eight hour window, because you're reperfusing an area that's already dead, um, and that blood flow is gonna come back 
like crazy and then they're gonna have a risk of bleeding. Um, so that's why, and you know, we've seen this so many times or I have, you know, myself seen it when there are patients who come in and you get one time last known well and then you end up with something totally different when a family member comes in. And it's like, oh my gosh, stop the TPA because what could be even worse than just having the stroke initially is the bleed that comes after if you are reperfusing an area that's already damaged. Um, so yeah, I would go by the morning um, symptoms if they're still there and just kind of persisted and even worsening, that would be the last known well. Okay, and so little anatomy. Um, so when you're dealing with stroke cases, um, the blood vessels uh, getting either blocked up or not even getting enough blood flow because that can even happen when you don't have enough blood to the area. Um, they can still have stroke presentation. Um, so the circle of Willis um, is, you know, basically the area that supplies uh, the brain uh, with blood flow. So when we were looking at these patients earlier, we have our MCA or middle cerebral artery. Um, that's where we've seen, you know, most of the stroke cases, but it doesn't just have to be there. You know, the internal carotid artery can get blocked, um, not just the portion that's, um, you know, in the brain um, or the cerebral ICA, but the cervical vessels where the ICA comes into the brain, that can also get blocked and lead to stroke-like symptoms. We also looked at, that look at the anterior cerebral artery. Um, this is the part that supplies like the leg foot portion. It goes up to this part of the head. Um, anybody can show up with just like leg weakness alone um, and then this would be the area that's affected. Um, and then if you're looking at MCA, I'd also like to you know, say that's an important thing to think about when you have a patient, like if it's on the left side, if they can't speak anymore because this vessel supplies the speech portion of the brain uh, and it also supplies um, the, or you would find signs of uh, weakness on the right side because it's contralateral when you think about symptoms from a left-sided stroke. Um, so they won't be moving their left, uh, their right side, sorry, right side as well, or maybe not at all. Um, they'll have sensory changes. They won't be able to feel the pinprick sensation or the light touch sensation on the right side. Um, you know, their ability to comprehend speech or their ability to, um, you know, speak themselves could be affected. And then if it's on the right, we've seen patients with symptoms where they come in with left-sided weakness, left-sided sensory changes, and those patients can kind of also neglect the entire left side. Um, so that can happen. You'll go in and talk to them. You'll be over here, and they're like, yeah, yeah, just looking completely over here and not um, even responding to you. Um, and then not only, because this is the anterior circulation, but not only can the anterior circulation be affected, you can also have the posterior circulation. So we also look at the basilar artery, uh, which supplies the brain stem, and also uh, the vertebral vessels. Um, and, you know, they supply the cerebellum. And what you can find is, like you said, you had the patient with the dizziness and the vertigo. Those are the, um, you know, the key symptoms that you'll pick up in those patients who come in with a basilar artery or vertebral artery stroke. They have imbalance. They're not able to, you know, get themselves coordinated. They're really dizzy. And those are like major emergencies as well because you think about your brain stem that supplies your breathing. Um, your consciousness, um, you know, if you affect that, then, you know, that's a big deal. So we make sure that we look at those vessels as well when we're, you know, looking at the imaging and make sure that we get those patients taken care of immediately because it can uh, have a worse outcome if we don't get to that in time. Okay. And so I'm going to go over the imaging uh, that we use. So CT, we talked about that earlier. Bone is bright. And so is blood. So the reason why we do the CT first is because you need to know if this is a hemorrhagic stroke versus an ischemic stroke. Now, this is uh, one of the patients that I actually saw, and they called the stroke team immediately. And, um, you know, we were 
able to go in and look at the imaging uh, right up front and, um, you know, we found the bleed. So not an ischemic stroke, but it's still an emergency and neurosurgery has to be notified in this case. And we still kind of help make sure that the blood pressure is under control because increased blood pressure in this case is not a good thing. Um, it can make the bleeding worse. Um, and so when you all go in, if you have patients that you're with, um, you know, you want to look at the imaging yourself, make sure you can kind of pick up on this. So anytime you see anything white um, that's not bone, uh, that's bleeding. And then, uh, not only that, but we can also identify worsening stroke. Um, and this is something that we would not treat with TPA, and we wouldn't do thrombectomy on either, just because like we talked about before, if you reperfuse this area, it can lead to more complications, lead to bleeding. Um, so this patient might have had the stroke maybe within 24 hours, um, and you know, unfortunately, there's nothing that we can do as far as intervention, but prevention uh, becomes key, and then just you know, long-term rehabilitation, uh, making sure that we do everything to make sure that they don't have a recurrence of stroke and they get everything that they need to hopefully improve if they've had deficits or physical deficits. Um, and that's another thing we'll see. Um, and sometimes, and this has happened to me, you can have very subtle changes. Um, and, you know, I've gotten better at kind of picking these things up. But, you know, we've also uh, called the neuroradiologists by phone and kind of asked them because they are the experts with reading imaging um, for our neurology patients. Um, but any time that we've had a question, we've been able to call them and say, okay, um, I'm looking at the caudate nucleus here. It looks a little bit abnormal. I think it's a hypodensity. Can you kind of take a look and see what you think? And so in this case, they were able to tell us that, you know, yes, it was. The stroke was um, there a little bit longer than uh, suspected. Um, so that's something else that, you know, sh should be able to pick up because anything that's darker than the brain matter means that, you know, you've had some type of ischemia, some type of injury. Okay, and then this once again is our hyperdense MCA sign. So blood vessels, like we said, aren't supposed to be bright on CT scan. Um, and whenever they are, that gives you the indication that there's possibly a clot there. But another thing, it can also be calcification from bad atherosclerosis. Um, so this is a very um, sensitive test to use to pick up uh, abnormalities in the blood vessels in the CT scan, but it's not as specific. So it can also be other things. But anytime you see this, this is going to immediately warrant stroke evaluation. And the patient, uh, if they're within a window of eight hours, should be sent for uh, thrombectomy and angiogram. Okay, and I'm gonna to try to go a little bit faster. Oh, no, go ahead. I just go back to, I just wanna hear the straight red eyes. So yes. The darker area is the skinnier vessels. Mm-hmm. The brighter areas are your blood and your gut. Mm-hmm. So this vessel is whiter. Is this with contrast? Is that showing up whiter? Oh, no, uh, this is actually clot. And then the thing that I forgot to mention was that um, we do non-contrast CT scan. Because if you give contrast, you're not gonna be able to pick up blood. You can't tell whether that's bleeding or not. Um, it obscures things. So no contrast on the CT scan. So that way when you see something like this, you know that it's a clot or it's bleeding. Um, it just means that the density is greater. Um, so, you know, like I said, if you have a blood vessel that looks kind of similar to this, a little bit gray, that's normal, that's fine. Blood flow is, you know, going the way it's supposed to. But anything like this, that's a very thick clot that's closing off the circulation. And basically asymmetry as well. Yes, asymmetry too, because exactly, good point, because if you have bilateral vessels that look like this, and the, even the symptomatology might not even be consistent, you know, you know that could be very bad atherosclerosis, or they could have actually just had contrast on a previous CT scan or a CTA, so that's happened to me before. I looked at it and I was like, oh, wait, that looks like a clot. And then I went back to the previous imaging. Oh, they had a CTA like five hours before, so it was fine. But thank you, good point, symmetry. Okay, and CTA, um, and I think the next speaker is gonna go over this. Um, but it's just another thing that we look at that's even more sensitive so that we can look at the blood vessels um, individually. 
and you know it, it helps us to kind of identify the clots a little bit better. So on this, if you give contrast, you're gonna see the blockage of flow. And so there's going to be a grayish or darker area that would indicate clot. Um, and so this is, you know, like I said, one of the things that we do up front, we like to have the CT and the CTAs ordered immediately because that speeds things up and gives us a lot more time to be able to get them in if they are a candidate for thrombectomy. And this is just another image of that. Um, not only do we look at the CTA of the head, we look at the CTA of the neck, and this is just our 3D reconstruction of it, um, like we looked at earlier. But you want to look at the neck vessels as well, because there could be a clot there that's preventing blood flow to go up to the brain. Could also be uh, stenosis from a plaque, because we have patients with very bad atherosclerotic disease, and um, the vessels can be occluded that way. And also carotid dissection. So when the blood vessel itself is, is damaged and it starts pulling away, or the intimal lining pulls away from the blood vessel, um, you can end up with stroke-like symptoms and formation of a clot that way as well. Okay, and this is um, our imaging here, CTA and angiogram. Um, and this is showing you what I just talked about, the thrombosis of the cervical carotid artery. Um, and so, I'm gonna kind of skip through here. Um, but yeah, this is just another image to show you all what we look for um, in stroke patients. We make sure we look at all of the vessels supplying the brain to make sure that we don't miss anything and we're able to treat the proper uh, diagnosis. Um, in MRI, MRI is more sensitive than CT scan, but it takes longer. So if it's a patient within a window, that's not the first test we're gonna do. But if we have a patient who's had symptoms for the past 24 hours, um, you know, somebody who comes in, their time last known well, puts them outside of the window for treatment, we're able to kind of just go ahead and order the MRI uh, up front because there's not much a CT scan is gonna give us unless, you know, there's a bleed. Um, so this is the important thing to know about MRI when you're dealing with stroke patients. It's bright on DWI and dark on ADC. And so DWI is diffusion weighted imaging. So when you have normal uh, brain cells, um, the brain parenchyma is normal, you have a flow or diffusion of water back and forth, and it relies on pumps to get the water out. Um, when you have ischemia, the water's not going anywhere. It's gonna stay inside of the cell, and that's called cytotoxic edema, because when you don't have oxygen and you don't have glucose and the things that are required for energy going up to the brain, it's basically gonna stop working. And so they, the patients end up with what's called cytotoxic edema, and this is what the DWI picks up because there's no proper diffusion of the water back and forth, so that's gonna show you bright on DWI. And then ADC is what you correlate with it um, because you're using a coefficient, and it's the, the very complicated how they, they do the, um, the calculations for the DWI, but this is the one that confirms a stroke. If you're able to look at the ADC and you see dark in the same areas where you've seen bright on a DWI, that indicates that the patient has had ischemia to that area. And so anytime you see that, that's the key. DWI is bright, ADC is dark, that indicates stroke. And this is just another um, you know, the sequence that we use. Um, it's T2, T2 flare. And these areas here are where there's brain white matter Patients with really high blood pressures, um, hypertension that's been long standing, we see a lot of these changes. Um, so it, it shows up white. Um, you can see the ischemic changes there. And so these are patients that, you know, even though it's not like the large vessel occlusions we saw earlier, it's not like an immediate stroke. This is like chronic changes, um, and these patients need to be on good blood pressure control. We need to make sure that you know we get that stabilized because you know their risk of stroke is also pretty high as well. Um, but this is another thing you can find, and then this was uh, amyloid angiopathy. Um, so in elderly patients, uh, especially, you can get a lot of deposits of uh, protein, uh, proteinaceous material called amyloid. 
And this is a problem because these patients can have a lot of microbleeds in the brain. Um, they can kind of come in with stroke-like symptoms too, but we look at these GRE sequences, sequence, sequences gradient echo, because it's good at showing uh, any blood or bleeding. Um, and these are more like the iron depositions from the blood um, that's getting picked up. Um, so these patients will have like more of a hemorrhagic kind of gray matter stroke pattern. Um, and so this is what this is showing. Um, and then we can also do MRA head and neck. It just keeps us from having to give radiation with the CTA. And sometimes if the patients are without or outside of the window, this is a pretty good test to do. You don't necessarily have to go and give contrast at that point. Um, we just, you know, can order an MRA and that also gives you good visualization, visualization of the blood vessels. Um, and then these are just our acute interventions. Um, we talked about uh, TPA, um, and this is tissue plasminogen activator. This is the medication that we give um, for any patient that's within a four and a half hour window um, to break up the clot. Um, and we can still do this at the same time uh, while we're planning to do thrombectomy. Um, and this is the one where the the interventionalist can go in and actually retrieve the clot with the device. Um, and that has to be within eight hours of last known well for us to get that done properly. Um, and so this is just uh, finally an image of the angiogram. Um, so I've had the opportunity to actually watch this being done on several patients. And so you can see where the flow isn't very good there. And this is why it's the gold standard. It's so sensitive and specific. You're able to see the blood vessels uh, immediately. And you're right there watching them um, you know, go through and do the procedure. And you can see when the blood flow is restored again. Um, and so this is you know, what we send the patients for when they're uh, within a certain window. And even if they just have um, like carotid artery stenosis or uh, very complicated cerebrovascular disease, um, we can send them in. And uh, this is just another one of the images that we rely on. And so in conclusion, hopefully, uh, you know, you all will be able to, you know, go in with some level of confidence and read these images yourselves whenever you have a stroke patient um, and, you know, understand uh, the reason why we use certain imaging when it's warranted and when it's not. Um, and then, you know, hopefully this will help in the care um, and management of stroke patients in the future. Um, and so. Uh, are there any questions? Okay. All right. Oh, uh huh. Uh, can you explain again what's the difference between MRI and MRA? Again. MR oh, okay. So the MRI is looking at the actual brain uh, itself. Um, so it's not going to give you a whole lot of detail on the vessels. The MRI is going to show you the brain tissue, um, whether there's been some change with that, either the white matter or the gray matter. Um, the MRI specifically looks at the vessels. Um, so you don't get a good glimpse of that until you actually are able to look at an angiogram because um, that's going to pick up um, you know, what you're seeing in the blood vessels themselves since that's what's supplying the brain tissue. Um, so that, that's the difference. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a parent diffusion coefficient. Um, so basically what it is, um, when you're looking at the DWI, that's based on one coefficient. Um, you can actually have diffusion changes and not have um, the ADC. It just kind of flips the image. Um, and so when you do that type of imaging with the MRI, you need to look at both of them because the ADC is basically what confirms um, the diffusion uh, restriction or it confirms that you've had the ischemia. Because um, we've had cases where we've had patients who had changes on DWI, it didn't necessarily mean that was um, like an ischemic change or lack of blood flow that was causing uh, the tissue to die or be compromised. Um, you know, it just means like maybe there's like a little edema there, a little bit of change. Um, but when you look at the apparent diffusion uh, coefficient, 
that's the one that shows you, you know, yes, there's not enough blood flow. That's what's causing this area of the brain um, to show these abnormalities. What does the ADC stand for? Apparent diffusion coefficient. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, um, and I just wanted to, you know, give a special thank you to these individuals um, for helping me. Yes. I'm sorry. Um, on CT, uh, yes, yeah, so the acute bleed, um, you know, like we saw, um, you know, was bright, um, which you could probably still see a little brightness with chronic bleeding too, but the GRE is what is really going to tell you um, that there has been chronic bleeding or long-term bleeding because then you'll see the darker areas. Um, so that's why we specifically uh, utilize that one. Um, and so, uh, yeah, any acute setting, because you'll see changes or, um, I guess, symptoms right away and then get the patient in. So CT is best for that. And especially from a timing uh, standpoint, because if you do the CT scan, it only takes a few minutes. If the patient needs intervention or treatment, you can get them in right away. Whereas MRI, it does take longer. They might not have symptoms that just showed up a few hours ago. It's going to be more like a chronic course. And I think, you know, that patient with the amyloid angiop uh, angiopathy, you know, they could have had like cognitive changes and, you know, other issues over time. And so you're more likely to notice chronic bleeding with that and look at the GRE to pick that up. All right, thank you all so much.